Hello and welcome to Film de Siècle, the film and media channel focused on all things 90s and 2000s. This week, Seb and Ollie will be discussing... Dunstan Checks In! Hello and welcome back to Film de Siècle, the discussion channel with myself, Seb and... Uh, me, Ollie Johnson. Yeah, ignore that long pause then, I think we all know who we are now. Uh, this week we're discussing a very um, different movie from last time, it's a bit of a departure. Dunstan checks in. Yeah, this was always inevitable if you know anything about... Uh... <laughs> well... We massively either. and aggressively stand Glenn, Glenn Shadix because oh. he, he's just fantastic and everything is in it. Oh, he exudes God, yeah. joy, I love him. I love him. He does. <laughs> Which is weird, like, considering in every movie he's in, something invariably bad happens to him. He's, um, like, I don't know how to put this. He's great slapstick comic relief. Yes! I mean, I'm sure he's more than that, but, you know, he is perfect for the, well, not whipping boy, what's a better phrase? Um, the, um... The character who bad things always happen to. So like in this movie, he gets slapped about several times. He uh, he doesn't fall in the cake. Yes, he does. He falls in the cake. Uh, spoiler well, alert, he falls he... in the cake. <laughs> okay. He falls into someone who then falls in the, in the, cake, in the cake. Yeah, it's... Um, he gets tranquilized, and then he collapses on the main antagonist of the movie. Well, actually, is she the main antagonist? It's... It's, it's not even the slapstick stuff. He's just really likable. He is. He, he's got a nice personality. He's got a lovely voice. You know, he, he he's just pleasant. And this is not the first time you will hear us stand the hell out of Glenn Shadix. Yeah, so if this isn't your thing, click away now. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, I feel so bad for him. And there's a lot of good names in this movie. You've got Rupert Everett, who I don't think has actually done anything since Shrek 2. <laughs> Which is a shame, because I liked Rupert Everett. I thought he was a great sort of villain character in loads of things. He was in Inspector Gadget, wasn't he? Gadget, Who was he in Shrek 2? Prince Charming. Oh, right. You know, Jamie Lannister. Th- there was <laughs> another <laughs> Shrek movie after that, or are we not acknowledging that Did one? He, um, well, I personally would be happy to never talk about Shrek the Third again. <laughs> but Rupert Everett, let me see. What's he been in since? I'm looking at his filmography now. Uh, he, wait a minute. Uh, he was last in Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children, which I never saw. He was in the Saint Trinian's movies. That was a thing. And yes, he he did resume his role as Prince Charming in Shrek the Third. So, yeah, huh. he seems like someone who should be doing a lot of television, but. Uh, apparently the last time he was on television was for Paul O'Grady show, which sort of dates, you know, how long ago it was. <laughs> ah, uh, bloody hell. But, yeah, okay, so what are your memories of this movie before we rewatch it and t- deep dive into our analysis? Right, well, uh, the first time I saw anything of it, uh, I was staying at my grandma's house with and my stepdad was also there. He had it on the TV. Yeah. I had no yeah. idea what the film was called. It was just something that was on. And I know, oh, yeah. there's a monkey. That's fun. <laughs> and, um, it, w- it was... Um, it was the bit where the kid just... The kid first found him. Yes. And that kid was in a load of movies at the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, he was like the go-to child actor for a while. I'm trying to remember his name. Was it Eric Lloyd? I think so. Perhaps. Um, yeah, he was in the Santa that's... Claus movies. He was in the Santa Claus movies. The two things I remember taking particular note of were that... And I was only like um, six or so at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was probably a bit older than that. I can't remember how old yeah. I was. But two, no. two things... Yeah, very young. Two things that I remember taking note of was that woman under the chandelier going, A monkey! Yes! And, and 
that arm gesture he does after they knock out Rupert Everett. Oh, right? I love that! Like, yes! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to get a screen cap of that. That's fantastic. Dude. Yeah. Um, put it up on the thing as I'm mentioning it. I, might, if... uh, I think I might, Ollie. I'll, I'll look for that. Yeah. I, I just love these family films. You know, you don't get films like this anymore. Yeah. Now, there's not much to analyse here, I dare say. Well, I, I beg to differ. You know, there's the um, you know subtle nuances of the um, progression of the Glenn Shadix character from yeah. guy who always talks about Neil Armstrong to guy who always gets slapped. The first man on the moon. Yes, yes he, he was. was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, well, what bit that what made me laugh when when I was younger, and it made me think maybe I'm a bit sadistic. Uh, was the bit where the dog jumps off the roof. Oh, God. Of, of this giant hotel and survives. But I didn't know the dog survived because I must have missed like the two-second clip of the show that the dog is okay. So I thought a dog jumped to its death and I found that hilarious as a child. What, what is wrong with me? I don't know. Uh. <laughs> it was like Joffrey. Um, but yeah, uh... Uh, it, I got the, my first experience with this movie is there were about 10 or 12 movies I like was one of my mom's boyfriends at the time. I make it sound like she had so many you know it was one at a time mind you but yeah, yeah. Uh, I, they, the, the family that she was going out with you know that family had like Sky Plus so they had tape lots of movies I didn't have yeah. Sky Plus so I got all these movies from Sky and one of them taped on there was Dunstan Checks In with Dunstan spelt wrong but I, I must have worn out that tape. I'd just rewatch it over and over again. I, I loved it. Oh, yeah. I I um, remember seeing it. I happened to walk in... um, Not walk in. I happened to channel hop yes, onto sir. Sky Movies when it was playing. And I got it at the beginning. And that was the first time I watched the whole thing. Yeah. Because I, I don't know. It, it was never really a phenomenon in the UK. I mean, in fairness, I don't think it was a phenomenon a- anywhere. But... You know what I mean? I don't remember it until it was out on Sky Movies. I don't think I'd have even known about it if it weren't for Sky Movies. Yeah, and I think we're doing uh, this movie in particular because, like, not because there's some great... Un- not that it's not underappreciated, it is. But I think most people just didn't know about it. Yeah, I mean, okay, I've just gone on Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah. And guess what it is on the tomato meter? It's going to be something ridiculous, like 9% or something, isn't it? Close! 12%! 12%? I don't understand what this movie has done to offend so many people on the internet. What does the critics' consensus say? The the critics say 12%. The audience score is 40%. Yeah, but it it normally has a critics' consensus, which is like a little written It says no consensus yet, although I would regard that as quite the consensus because everyone raised it so lowly apparently 17 people have raised it at 12%, 12% they don't always put it on uh, well 17 yeah. critics that, that's a very small number of critics do you know what though it baffles me that it's that high it baffles me that 17 assumably grown ass people went on the internet and decided to vent about Dunstan checks in and how terrible it is I don't understand what this yeah. movie is doing. Oh, that's I, re- doing I remember there being a lot of. I remember there being a lot of Spider-Man toy placements. <laughs> yeah, I remember that loads. Well, do you think that it was like DC, like sabotaging the movie? <laughs> but there were a lot of Spider-Man placements. The, the kid had a Spider-Man like cuddly toy. There were a few other Spider-Man references, but I can't remember what they were. Yeah. I mean, it's set in New York, so. Uh, Plot-wise, it makes sense that the kid would like Spider-Man. Yeah. So, yeah, to sum up, it's a movie you like? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I haven't seen it in years, but I liked it the last time I saw it. I can't remember the last time I saw it. Well, let's both go away, have a watch, and see how it um, measures up today. All right, then. Back in a moment. And we're back. Just watched Dunstan Checks In, haven't we? Uh, yep. So, I'm going to ask the first question in our list of questions. Ollie, did you like it? I did, yes. I, I did. I very much liked the movie. Me too. Care to elaborate? 
Not really. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I don't know what you're expecting from this. I mean, it's a monkey caper about a monkey slash jewel thief in a hotel. It's just fun, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a heartwarming movie. I, I, I enjoy watching it. I, I just do. It, yeah, it is. Um, I think the second question is, did the movie accomplish its goals and what were they? Um, yeah. Well, what were its goals? Well, I think to be a family-friendly movie. Yeah. I mean, it made me laugh. I consider that a goal. Yeah, yeah. And uh, do you know what? It, have you have you noticed how the, almost the entire movie is set just in the hotel? I can't think of many other movies like that. Yeah, it's a very, very localised movie. It world builds very well as well. You know, considering that its world is entirely contained within a hotel. Yeah. Well, y- y- you get the impression that nobody likes the boss. Um... Yeah, I like how it shows the big people, the little people, you know, the people who make things work. You know, it shows things behind the scenes. You know, it shows the, you know, like utility workers, shows the chefs. You know, it shows everything. It's not like it's a, a movie. There's just in a book. enough, I think. There's just enough exposition as to who everyone is and what everyone's like. Yeah, you can surmise a lot just through small details. And this movie is a lot better written than it really needed to be because it's a family movie. Uh, it didn't need to be The Godfather. Uh, well, that's good, because it's not. <laughs> no. Although there were a lot of death threats in this movie. It was quite dark. And there are. Considering it wasn't a mafia organised crime movie. Well, yeah, they were organising crime, so I suppose you could say it was an organised crime movie. <laughs> and here's a shocker. The budget was $16 million. It made nearly $10 million back. Oh. It, it, it lost. It lost money. That's a shame. I mean, I can see why it did, but it, it's a shame. So, I guess it didn't accomplish its goals to a great extent, although I think as a film it did. I mean, like apparently its goal was to sell movie tickets so that it could make more money than it cost to produce. And that didn't happen. No, unfortunately not. <laughs> I'd have seen this in the cinema. They don't make movies like this anymore, you know, like just fun movies. I don't think... Um... Not outside of franchises. I mean, you've got stuff coming through like, um, you know, Sonic, which has a similar kind of fun spirit to it. But But outside of franchises, it doesn't happen. Yeah, not really. But I don't think, not knowing uh, what I think of the movie, I don't think I would elect to see this at the cinema. Because I usually reserve cinema trips for something that's visually impressive. I think this is. No, I mean in a spectacle kind of way. This is very much more slapstick. I'm not saying I don't go to the cinema unless I expect to be visually wowed. I mean, we had a laugh seeing the latest Johnny English movie, didn't we? Yeah. Well, I did. I um, choked on ice cream at one point. I was laughing you inhaled so hard. ice cream, I, I seem to remember. I was laughing so much, I inhaled ice cream. Uh, I was choking for about ten seconds. You were asking me if I was alright, you know. That's how funny it was. <laughs> but, uh, it was funny because you almost died. <laughs> yeah, that is hilarious for anyone except me. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, do you know what? It, this film set out to entertain families, you know, back when I was a family. Uh, okay, back when I was a child, you know what I mean? Back when I had a family. Yeah. <laughs> what am I, Sasuke? <laughs> no, back when I was a child, I, I loved this movie. I really watched it loads. It was on a video uh, and it entertained me. So for me, it accomplished its goals. I don't know if it did that for a lot of people. I'm surprised how much hate this movie gets. Unwarranted, I think, because it's a it's an inoffensive movie. It's not like it's done anything particularly controversial, you know, that deserves any kind of, you know, uh, distaste. I can't imagine expending the energy to hate on this movie. It's not worth it, yet some bo- yet nine people have spent money on this movie just so they could dislike it on YouTube. Well, they may have spent money on it not knowing what it was and then disliked it and voiced their displeasure. I suppose. But... What were they expecting from this? It, it, you can watch the trailer, 
Uh, you look at the picture and it's like two kids and a monkey. What do you expect? What did it not deliver on? I don't know. You're the one that wanted a fucking Dunstan Checks In video on your analysis channel. What do you want? Lord oh. Rutledge is like symbolic of the evils of colonialism. <laughs> he is fun. And, and don't act like you didn't want it. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> so yeah, to sum up question two. For me it did, but apparently it didn't accomplish its goals. <laughs> Three, did this movie exceed your expectations? Um, well, I don't know, because I only saw parts of it as a kid and then, well, watched the whole thing again as a small child, so, like, I knew what to expect of the movie, and, well, I, I guess it did exceed my expectations in how dark it gets. I mean, I didn't remember that Yeah, uh, so I mean, much. there were several moments throughout this movie where we were like, Jesus, I can't believe they got away with this. <laughs> you know, um, that's shocking. Like, um, you know, he threatens to kill a small child, Lord Rufflidge, for villain. And, um, since we've and this seen is the first five minutes. Where, um, the kid first meets Dunstan and they shake hands, we now know where Ryan Johnson got his inspiration for that iconic scene in The Last Jedi. Yes, it, it had so many Last Jedi vibes when he barges in. Yeah. Also, Dunstan, that scene, stop that! <laughs> that scene was so dark because uh, he, Dunstan, the orangutan, would rather uh, jump to his death with a small child than go with his master. You know, it just shows how fearful he is what he can do. You see him get out his rod. He talks about how he killed his older brother and the, the uh, orangutan's older brother, who is also an orangutan, by the way, and picked <laughs> from... <laughs> I, I don't mean that Lord Ruffledge killed his own. Can we talk about how brilliant that character is, Lord Ruffledge? Lord Ruffledge, and uh, he's a he's a pantomime villain, basically. Yes, and I love that. Who gave this man a peerage? <laughs> Nobody knows. <laughs> you know, I... I... <laughs> There are certain things that I don't think the writers of the film really expected you to think about. I think Americans don't realise that lords actually have a constitutional role. I think they think it's just, like, a name. Or something hereditary, maybe. Well, it is, to some extent. You've got hereditary peers, and then you've, you know, got other kinds of peers, but... I don't know which type he is. I mean, he talks about inbreeding several times, which is odd considering it's a kid's movie. You know, he jokes about it to yeah. some random Although, people. Um, speaking of it being a kid's movie, they, they gave it one S-bomb. And let's just talk about how perfectly placed it was. Oh, <laughs> yes. The best <laughs> S-bomb in a kid's movie ever. Yeah. Honestly, watch this scene for yourself. It's hilarious. It's the scene where the owner of the hotel... Well, not the owner, the manager of the hotel... Uh, Jason Alexander, who I think was in, um, oh, uh, Seinfeld. I think he was in Seinfeld. But yeah, yeah, yeah um, he's talking to these two old ladies who are there to see him about some sort of deadly skin disease that they're <laughs> raising awareness Not of. Not deadly, just unsightly. Yes, that's it. <laughs> Not deadly, just unsightly. All the good diseases were taken. I just love the weird dialogue in this movie and how they make all these strange jokes like that. Yeah. Somebody I mean, had a lot of fun writing this movie. It's not a good film. It's not a good film, but it's a great time, if that makes sense. Yes, it's a brilliant time. And it's just either somebody had a great time writing this movie or a lot of people had a great time ad-libbing it and making it funny. One of the two. I don't know who yeah. to give the credit to. I have got to say, though, I didn't really get the point of Pee Wee Herman in it. He felt really superfluous. Yeah. Like, it's like they felt like they needed an extra obstacle in the last third of the movie. So they got this animal exterminator who's really eccentric, goes on about turtles in the toilet, and yeah, that's a conversation that happens, and has him deliberately go out of his way to not capture him, but kill him. He has these tranquilizer darts that kill orangutans, which defeats the purpose of them being tranquilizers. Yeah. I mean, his animal control is not person control, so that's a really weird dark turn. And I love dark turns in this movie, but that felt like they were going too far. Yeah, also, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Yeah. I mean, it's weird that I'm saying that this movie took it too far, but it actually did. 
Well, it, it depends on how many uh, departures from being sensible you can stomach in one film. But once you've set the tone of, like, eccentric aristocrat with a monkey jewel thief for a pet. I mean... He's already an intimidating villain because at several points in the movie he repeatedly threatened to kill this child, uh, you know, with no uncertainty about it, and tried to follow through with killing the orangutan several times. So he's already a big threat. You've already got the um, uh, Debrow, Debrow alert. I love that, by the way. Uh, yeah. that sort of a running joke where everybody in the hotel despises and fears her, who's the wife of the person who owns the hotel. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> she's already threatened to fire, uh, which isn't as serious. You know, the dad who manages the hotel. Well, she basically very passive-aggressively implied that if she didn't get the results she wanted from this inspector visit, he would be fired. Yes, and by the way, the premise of this movie on the part of the dad is that they're awarding a sixth star to a hotel, and this could be one of them. You know, it's in the running which sort of defeats the purpose of having a five-star system, because surely that just de-ranks automatically all the other hotels. I think there are above five-star hotels, though. I seem to remember reading this. I think they go as yeah. high as seven. How many stars have there I definitely recall hearing about a seven-star hotel at one point. Obviously, I've never been in or even seen okay. one. According to hotel ratings... Um, hmm... Uh, Apparently there's different things all over the world. Yet yeah, you can have... Oh, apparently the highest is five-star. Although you can have a half-star hotel. Yeah, I, I just re- really enjoy this movie, to be honest with you, Ollie. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like... I I would say guilty pleasure, but I don't... like. I hate that term. It's an insult to both guilt and whatever the thing your pleasure is. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And there's just a lot of great scenes in this movie, like when, um, you know, M- Mrs. Uh, uh, oh, not Lamont, what's her name? Um, Mrs. De Brow, uh, you know, is slighted by this woman called Consuela, who works at the hotel, so she has him, him her fired. But the, you know, the hotel manager whose job this is sort of fixes it so that she gets a paid holiday if she goes out of the room crying to make it look like she has been fired. And I love that. Yeah, the the conceit being that Mrs. De Brown never remembers who it was she asked to fire. I really like the dad character in this movie because he's on the staff side. You know, he's down there on the ground floor with them working on things when they're preparing the hotel for the ball. You know, he clearly cares about the people who work for him. He tries his best to be a good dad. In fact, you know, when he doesn't believe you know, his son Kyle, who's the main sort of kid character, about Dunstan, the first thing he does when he finds out that Dunstan is real is make sure that he apologises to him for not believing him. But what's really weird is that he's okay with them killing Dunstan, or he doesn't register any sort of objection. That is, like, the weirdest part of this movie for me. It is a little weird, yes. Uh, Again, this movie is great until, like, the... the, um, the end of the middle and then it just sort of dips in quality for about 10 minutes and then the rest of it's great it's literally from when they introduce Paul Rubens um, exterminator character up until the whole Lambert Bignoc thing which I think is brilliant by the way where they just Paul Ruben yeah he's Paul Ruben oh that's his name isn't it Paul Rubens the guy who plays um, uh, the exterminator you know um uh, what's his name? Pee Wee Herman, who I think is like the American version of Mr. Bean. I don't know. Uh, I think he's like a more talkative Mr. Bean, or at least he dresses like one anyway. Yeah, I, I, I'm. I'm not sure. I, I'm. I'm yeah. not familiar, really. But you're right, Ollie. That character is so superfluous to the plot of this movie. I don't know why he's even here, to be honest with you. The extent of my knowledge about Pee Wee Herman was that he was on an episode of WWE Raw once. And all I know is that he's referenced a lot of times in Family Guy for some reason. I don't know. <laughs> it's a popular thing in America, that's all I know. I don't think it ever came to the UK. I don't know if it ever needed to, to be honest with you, Ollie. Yeah. Well, anyway, getting back to Dunstan. Yeah. Uh, is there anything... Oh, wait, of course there is uh, more to oh? say. We haven't talked about our boy. 
No, we haven't. Ah, oh, the Shadix, man. And um, Glenn Shadix. Fifty Shadix of Grey. Like, we're, 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 we may be overplaying our fondness for him, but, like, we just really like Glenn Shadix in this movie. He's just... He's just a nice guy who's trying to do his job, and then he just gets completely... Uh, Abused by everybody who comes across him. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I love how... Um, but no, uh, Glenn Shadix is a great sort of like comedy big guy sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, in every sense of the word. And yeah. he is just... I think this is my favourite role of his, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I mean, imagine that, you know, like having the zenith <laughs> of your acting career be Dunstan Checks In. Oh. It's not a it, diss. It, I really it, like him in this. I, I like him in this, and he's probably the one of the main reasons I like this film as much as I do. But, you know... Um... Also, the reason why I think he's the heart of this movie is because he's the first character we see, and the last character we see. You know, the movie opens with him, and then closes with him. Yeah. Um, immediately sets him up by naming him as a character that is more important than, you know... Yeah. Just... Then it seems, because he's constantly saying, oh, I'm Lionel Spaulding. And then it seems irrelevant and people are ignoring him or not giving him the attention. And it turns out, plot twist, he was the hotel inspector the whole time. And because everybody was snubbing him, throwing his dog out the, uh, off the roof, uh, you know, there's context if you haven't seen this movie that you might be missing. <laughs> um, <laughs> but basically, he's slapped about, mistreated, ignored all throughout this movie, and it turns out he's the one they should have been paying attention to because there's this weird sort of subplot where Mrs. Dubrow thinks that Lord Rutledge, you know, the villain Rutledge. of the movie... Yeah, Rutledge. Sorry, I keep saying Rutledge. Yeah, <laughs> Lord Rutledge. Uh, I must give the Lord his due respect. Um, yeah. What well, you know, they think that he's the hotel inspector because they see him searching for Dunstan and they think that he's inspecting everything. Yeah. Oh, he is thorough. <laughs> a, yeah, when he's searching the vents for Dunstan. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's a string of like loosely connected um, slapstick gags with a monkey. Yeah. Like with, that with does some good a character pretty work. contrived plot around it, but what else does it need to be? <laughs> like, I don't know. It, it does some good character work. I mean, you've got the older brother who I. I guess he's just there to support the younger brother, but his whole thing is that he's a bit of a perv. Yeah, and then you see him spying on like weird. girls, and uh, there's only like one scene in the movie that's very brief towards the end where it's reciprocate, you know, where it's hinted that it is reciprocated and he is actually like good with women of an appropriate age. And that's <laughs> it. That is all we see. The rest of it, it's, it's like his Master Roshi. It's really weird. And there's a scene where he's, like, he's using the camera system to spy on two girls at the swimming pool. And then, uh, you know, he sort of turns to the security officer and says, Ah, what do you think of him? What do you expect him to say? <laughs> yeah, that's... Um... That was a really weird, yikes scene randomly thrown yeah. in. And th why did that need to be there? What a weird situation to put someone in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I feel sorry for the actor who plays the security yeah. officer having to say, yeah, it's all right. Because that's all you can say in that situation. You can't just say, well, I suppose you should just say, now nah, you're being a bit of a perv, go away. There isn't really much to analyse about this film, is there? It's a monkey caper. It's a slapstick comedy with... Um, like... Do you know what? You say there's not much to analyse, but we have spent 20 minutes talking about this movie. <laughs> You've spent 20 minutes talking about this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> nah, the, nah, they're really... Can we talk more about why Glenn Shadix is so amazing in this movie? Well, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure we could. <laughs> well, I like how Glenn he Shadix is amazing in general. Like... <laughs> he's immediately set up to be kind-hearted. He cares about his dog. You know, he wants his dog to be happy. Also, the scene in the beginning where the opera singer accidentally gets splashed by the water... His first instinct, even though he himself got a face full of water, is to jump in and help her. That's his first instinct. Yeah, I mean... He, he never means any harm. His kindness is repaid by his dog, uh, you know, that he's entrusted a small child with, jumping off the ledge. And uh, probably my favourite piece of dialogue in this movie is the smelly ledge monster. <laughs> it was the smelly monster on the ledge. It was the smelly ledge monster! Yeah. <laughs> I just love the delivery on that line. 
It's perfect. Yeah. <sighs> uh, so yeah, we well, yeah. did the movie exceed our expectations? I certainly think so. It was a lot better than it needed to be, frankly. They could have put less effort into this and probably made as much money, to be honest with you. It, it's fluff, but it's at least fun. It's not one that, you know, would have a legion of loyal fans who would repeatedly see this in the cinema. So, it, you know, people probably saw it once in the cinema and that was it. And considering that, they could have put a lot less effort in, you know, than they did. Yeah, I, I, I've seen worse films make more money. Like... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it could have been worse, uh, and it, you know, it was better than it needed to be. Okay, question four: Is there an element in this film that specifically appeals to you? I think they know what we're going to say, don't they? Yeah, Glenn yeah. fucking shaked it. <laughs> it's just lovely. He's a joy to watch. He, really... he is like he, he's a he's a really good comic relief guy. Yeah, he he's just perfect for. I, I wish he was still alive, and I wish he could be making movies to this day. You know, that, that would have been great. He was also the voice of the mayor in the Nightmare Before Christmas, I believe. Yeah, and he was in Beetlejuice, so he was a friend of Tim Burton's. Who knows? He maybe could have got a Charlie in the Chocolate Factory cameo. Yeah, if he lived. that would have been good. You know, what else could he have been in that um, Tim Burton's... Oh, he could have been in... Um, what role could he have played in Sweeney Todd? Oh, God. I dread to think. Um, I think he'd just be some sort of unfortunate soul that gets slaughtered. I'd want him to play Pirelli, the the, the Italian barber that he... Uh... I could picture that. I could see him doing a bit of a sort of go-compare-man sort <laughs> of big Italian bloke. Yeah. Uh, but I just, I love everything, including, you know, his soft accent, I love his mannerisms, I like how excited he is about the baby quiche, <laughs> it's just, <laughs> I like how dejected and sad he looks when he gets ignored, like, uh, there's a bit where he tries to introduce himself to the hotel owner's wife and says, hi, I'm Lionel Spalding, and she says, oh, of course you are, and carries on with Lord Ruffledge, because she thinks that he's the hotel inspector. Yeah. Oh. And he gets slapped because they think he's a pervert because there's a scene where Dunstan puts the glasses on this lady's chest and he lost his glasses so he grabs them and she thinks he's trying to grab her. Yep. And uh, then uh, a woman he's sitting next to Dunstan is under the table and lifts up her skirt so she slaps him. (laughs) (laughs) You really need to see this movie because if you've not seen it and you're listening to us talking you're probably wondering what kind of weird movie this is. there's not much to talk about other than what's literally there. Dunstan gets a man laid. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. There's a massage scene where a man's massaging this weird sort of character who keeps appearing on the side who's some sort of eccentric rich woman who gets robbed. I think we've covered what appeals to us. Yeah. That is the Shadix, man. <laughs> the Shadix. <laughs> Good luck editing together all those Glenn Shadix pictures in other things. <laughs> oh, it's a labour of love, Ollie. It's a labour of love. Yep. How does the film stack up today, Ollie? Against what? <laughs> um, the, the really, Good point. There really isn't... Um, they don't really make animal comedy films that much anymore that aren't animated. No. I mean, I suppose even if the animals are well treated... And I should imagine in a movie this big, they would have. Yeah. You know, I, I think it probably just leaves a bad taste for some people today, perhaps. And that's why they're not commercially successful. I mean, this wasn't commercially successful. No. Um, how does it stack up today? Well, again, I've certainly seen movies I enjoyed much less. Uh... Yeah. And I mean, you can't really say it's of its time because... You know, it's a hotel movie. How much have hotels changed over the last 24 years? I don't re- This movie's like nearly a quarter of a century old, by the way. Although, um, that hotel had a weird sort of policy regarding personal information. Yes, I was about to bring this up, actually. <laughs> There's a few things in this movie that raised my eyebrows, actually. Uh, I'll come to the point that you raised in a bit. I was going to bring that up earlier, but there's a scene where Lord Rutledge, Rutledge, the villain, Rutledge, yeah. Oh, sorry, I'm, 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 I'm butchering you, man. I'm doing you wrong. <laughs> um, but yeah, he sneaks into uh, Mrs. Delacroche, who's the lady who 
uh, you know, had sex with her monsieur because she thought he was a orangutan. No, she thought the orangutan was him. Yes, that's right. I got that the wrong way round. That's embarrassing. <laughs> but yeah, very uh, he sneaks in... there. <laughs> what kind of movie is this? But yeah, he sneaks into um, Mrs. Delacroche's room because to place a marker because that's the room that Dunstan is going to rob. Yeah. Uh, and he's wearing the uniform of a concierge. Which leads me to think, how did he get that? Did he beat up a concierge and steal his uniform? Did that happen off screen? Do different hotels have different uniforms for concierge and staff? Yeah, like maybe he just has that uniform and because his whole thing is that he robs hotels, even though he seems to be fairly well off, or I don't know how much of it's a front or how much of it's a flex, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's sort of hinted that his income relies on his orangutan, which he somehow has robbing people's hotel rooms specifically. Yeah. And, well, presumably he has a fence that he can fob the jewellery off off. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Well, this also, never for some reason, though. no. The hotels in this movie have computers. Uh, you know, very early 90s computers. You know, it looks very dated today, but these computers give him access to people's personal information like what rooms people are staying in and also for some reason an inventory of Mrs. Delacroche's uh, jewellery and how much that it's worth why does the hotel need this information and why is it available to literally any guest that stays at the hotel yeah I mean I don't know um, what data protection laws were like at the time but I doubt they were that bad Yeah, I'm sure they were a lot less lenient than that. I'm sure you could still get in trouble for making it public knowledge, uh, you know, what private possessions a guest has and how the value of those private possessions. (laughs) Also, there's a scene where Dunstan is hiding in one of the hotel rooms and posing as a person called Lan Bignoc, who's a doctor, Lan Bignoc, by the way. And uh, the way that um, Rupert Everett's um, uh, Lord Rutledge... I did it right that time. Yeah. You're proud of me, all. Yeah. Yeah. The way that he finds out that what room he's staying in is by doing a word search for banana and finding that um, Dr. Nagok has ordered like 20 different banana sundaes or dishes that have bananas in some way. Why is this information public knowledge for everyone? We found a Dr. Lambin Nock on Twitter, by the way. Yeah, there's like, yeah, that's a joke account, by the way. I urge you to follow them. They haven't tweeted since 2014, unfortunately. And there's about 12 on Facebook as well. Some of them must be real people. <laughs> we do our homework. Because I wanted to know if it was like an in joke or if the name was based on a real life person that maybe had something to do with orangutans. Next week, we'll do some actual film analysis, we swear. Oh, please, Ollie, this is a. This is the best film analysis you'll ever find about Dunstan Checks In. I don't dispute that, but... <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I think the film stacks up today, but there's some really weird details. Uh, the the midpoint is a bit weak, where they introduce you know, the superfluous um, Paul Rubens character. Yep. But on the whole, the beginning is excellent. You know, it's a, for, for the movie it is. It's an excellent introduction to the world, the characters, sets everything up nicely, uh, makes you feel for Dunstan. It's a better film than it has a right to be. Yes. And the ending is just top notch. I love the fight at the end <laughs> where they're just throwing, where the dad and Lord Rutledge uh, get into a fight and they're throwing food at each other. You know, they're bashing together cutlery. Yeah. And they've dubbed in sword sounds when they're. Yes. <laughs> It's fantastic. It's just such a well choreographed fight. I love it. Uh, and you can tell they had fun doing it. I uh, had a bit of a Mandela effect for that moment because you know that. Did you? That arm gesture that Dunstan makes the whole. Yes. I sort of remembered him doing that after Rotledge was knocked out. But it's a bit after That's that. That's so weird. Yeah, because he. Oh, I'll come to that in a moment. Um, this movie has my favourite example of a Chekhov's gun. On film, possibly. That's for Chekhov's cake. Yeah. <laughs> Where they're, they're having this big ball that they're bringing back. 
Um, they've made a giant cake for it, you know, which when there's an orangutan, you know, running around your hotel room, that's just tempting fate, isn't it? Yeah. But it's set up, you see it loads, and it delivers when uh, Dunson, the orangutan, jumps on uh, Mrs. De Brow, and they fall into the cake together, and it's reused greatly when the uh, abused and oppressed hotel manager, Jason Alexander, throws a piece of cake at Mrs. De Brow. The ultimate fantasy if you've got a terrible boss. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's the ultimate fantasy, but it's a cathartic experience Ooh. nonetheless. It's cathartic. It's, it's, it's a PG movie, keep in mind. Oh, yes. You can't go all Sweeney Todd on <laughs> that. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, and then then you get the ultimate reveal that Glenn Shade, it is the hotel inspector, he's been tranquilised by accident, so he collapses on her. Yeah. And they use the cake three times. The Chekhov's gun is fired three times, and it's fantastic. It's mwah, oh, perfect. Uh. One more thing I want to bring up in the how does the film stack up today. Was the owner of a hotel, this old man who you occasionally see, he's a lot quieter than his wife who does all the, um, you know, busy work. Yeah. Was he cheating on his wife? I never got that. Well, at the very end, you see his, he arrives, he's not with his wife, she's scouting hotel sites in Alaska. I don't know if that's a euphemism, like, actually ah, won't be a problem anymore. Um, but he's with a considerably younger woman. I don't know, there's just something about that scene, like, who is this woman? Why is she important? Why is she there? You know, is he getting a bit on the side? I wouldn't be surprised, but I don't think it's important. <laughs> no, it's just weird that it raises these questions. <laughs> yeah. It's so unnecessary for a movie like this for there to be any extra marital, you know, sort of goings on. <laughs> Yet it's a possibility. Yeah, it is. Uh, one other thing I remember when I was younger is uh, the bit where you've got the scene in the spa where Glenn Shadix is working out. There's a music cue after... Um, Kyle loses Dunstan that always made me jump as a child I used to be terrified of this scene just because the music was scary so I'd look away for a few seconds and it, it's the least scary scene you could imagine yeah I'll try and play a sound bite of that few seconds so people Dunstan that's right before the gym isn't it yes I don't know why it just terrified me as a child. It's weird how these things <laughs> set you off. Yeah. I used to be terrified of the Jaws theme tune as a kid, so I, I get you. Yeah, but at least the shark is terrifying. There's nothing terrifying about this scene. I'd never seen Jaws. Like, I was well, just scared of the music. What? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> for some reason, I can imagine like your family terrifying you by randomly playing the music. Uh, but yeah, the film sacks up well. Well, it stacks up about as well as it was ever going to. Yeah. It's like, it's got something, it's got reasons to come back to it 24 years later, which, considering the purpose of this movie, it didn't really need. Yeah, fair enough. Was the film received appropriately at the time? I'd... Maybe? Uh, I maybe. don't know. It, it lost money. Um, maybe more people should have seen it. The acting in it is good. There's a lot of laughs. You know, it's a fun movie. So, a little bit, like, maybe it should have done a bit better? I don't know. I think it's a TV movie, if that makes sense. It's it's a movie that you see on yeah. TV. And, <laughs> like, so... I will say it doesn't deserve to be derided. No, I don't, I don't think so. It's not doing any harm. It's not spreading anything harmful or problematic. Uh... You know, there's no reason to have a problem with this movie, really. And to the best of our knowledge at the moment, nobody in it was a monster. No, I hope not. Um, uh, although, there was that weird Benicio Del Toro cameo. Uh, at least I think it was him. I, d I doubt it was Benicio Del Toro. It was someone who looked vaguely like Benicio Del Toro in that moment. It looks just like how he looked in The Last Jedi. 40 minutes 47 if you don't believe me check it out yeah he's referring to the guy who's hauling the luggage yeah 
I don't know. I'd like to believe that it's Benicio del Toro and that he demanded a cameo in Dunson Checks In. You know, he was disappointed that everyone was already cast. He wanted the Pee Wee Herman role. That's what he wanted. <laughs> and he didn't get it, so they just, to appease him, they let him play a concierge in the background. Uh, Dunstan checks in. It's a monkey movie. What the hell else do you want? <laughs> yeah. This guy, Ken Krapis, I don't know how to pronounce it, Krapis, who directed this movie, uh, other movies on his resume, The Benneker Gang, Sesame Street Presents Follow That Bird, Vibes, He Said, She Said, Dunstan checks in, Beautician and the Beast, Noah, Sexual Life, that's a bit of a odd path to go on. Sisterhood yeah. of the Travelling Pants. I don't know what that movie is. Licence to Ed. He's just not that into you, which I have heard of. Big yeah. Miracle. And his last work was 2015 with Walk in the Woods. Uh-huh. So I guess this is his biggest movie? I don't know how well the Sisterhood of the Travelling Pants did, but... I have at least heard of that. Have you? I've heard the name Sisterhood of the Travelling Pants. If only being referenced... It's a film series, apparently. Apparently, there's two movies, and a third film is in development. And there's a musical adaptation of the film. I didn't realise it was that big a hit. Apparently. I mean, so- sorry if I made it sound like I was crapping on this. I don't know if it's good or not. I don't know what it's about. <laughs> I guess maybe one day I might find out. But yeah, uh, it was received, I guess, appropriately at the time. Probably should be received a little bit better today. If it's on the TV, give it a watch. If you've got kids, show them it. I think they'd like it. Okay, well, thank you for joining us. This was our in-depth, deep dive into the uh, intricate lore of Dunson Checks In. Yes, the deep lore of the, I don't know, the majestic hotel cinematic universe. Yes, the, the deep lore of the scene where the older brother's saying, destroy my porn collection if I die. Yeah. And um, the part where it's revealed that it, the Majestic Hotel eventually becomes the Overlook Hotel from The Shining. Yeah, and... Uh, well, the kid looks similar, actually. Oh, God. Kid. He does. Which is weird, considering that it's, like, 20 years later. Huh. Also, it's really weird to see the guy who plays Pee Wee Herman, who's, like, a kid-friendly character, from what I can tell, point a gun at a child. That happens in this movie. Yeah... And I, I will never forgive the the wife who's the you know the owner of the hotel for gaslighting Glenn Shadix. Yeah, absolutely. That's unforgivable. You know, he he saw a monkey head. I believe him. You know, why don't you believe him about the monkey head? Well, we know he was telling the truth. Yeah, yeah, we're on his side. He helps the opera singer. He's a good guy. Good guy. Yeah. Good guy, Glenn. Yes, 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 yes. All right, we will see you next week. We've got a slightly more discussable movie. We'll put it that way. Yeah, we just really wanted to do a video about Dunstan checks in. Who could blame us? (laughs) All right, we'll be digging deeper next week. So see you then. See you. See you next time.